You're listening to Crossing Borders with ANYP for the Always Next Year Podcast Studio Network. You can find the team on our Twitter at ANY Podcast or visit us on our website, www.alwaysnextyearpodcast.com. And now, to bring us in, the Jack Dolls. A fighting man I used to be, revered and feared through Killarney. Now I'm back to hitching with the wind. But if Mickey Flynn should ever fight me, I'll throw me call shit all behind me and square off on that son of a bitch again. He cracked open a rib or two, he beat me Sunday through and through. And so she or my unconscious reign. I won me healthy sheriff fights, well lucky son still have me life since Mickey Flynn beat me dumb and lame. Hello and welcome to another episode of Crossing Borders here at Always Next Year Podcast. That was the Jack Dolls who brought us in. If you want to take a look at them, you can find them on all social medias, I believe, but I think that they want you to use their Instagram first. It is the Jack Dolls, J-A-C-K-D-A-W-S on Instagram. I am Shane and I'm with Connor today because we are talking all things, all Philadelphia sports. Connor, how are you, sir? Good, good. How about yourself? Uh, I am also doing well. I uh, just got out of two in-person studio sessions since you're still in Canada. We do this via Skype, which is awesome. Um, but we talked some Phillies baseball earlier, talked some 76ers basketball. Uh, so it is going to be good to, to get a little bit of Flyers talk, a little bit of Eagles talk in, which are our first two points for today. Um, for those of you guys who are new to Crossing Borders, who are just checking us out for the first time, this is a show where we take some of the most highly debated topics amongst all Philadelphia Philly sports, and we dedicate a portion of the segment to each of the four sports and each of those takes. Uh, and so we will bring out our first take uh, on Flyers coaching and the complete revamp of the of the coaching situation here for the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, obviously, we already know the head coach situation was was in. Then the remainder of the coaches fill out. Connor, if you want to let everyone know who is coaching uh, what now for the Philadelphia Flyers uh, as of last week. So it'll be Michelle Terry and doing the offense and the power play, I do believe. And Mike Yo is doing the penalty kill and the defense. And it puts everyone's favorite punching bag of the coaching staff, who still has a job through four different head coaches and coaching regimes. Ian LaPerrier will be up in the press box as he will perform a meaningless duty of scouting. But the important thing is that he is not on the bench during games and that he is no longer controlling the penalty kill. That's so, probably why I forgot about him, because the, the job is literally meaningless. I it completely essentially forgot is. to mention it. He's basically a morale guy. He, he's just he's there to to be one person that the remaining flyers from old regimes can continue to go to and have a conversation with and not feel like they're getting chewed out. Um, you know, so everyone needs a mommy to their daddy and that's right now what he is. Um, so Agreed. I think it's a respect so, thing. I said it before. I think it's just a respect thing by the flyers ownership. We do see it all the time. Take a puck to the face and have a job for life. Uh, and that joke has now become a reality, and it just is sad, uh, if you ask me. A great guy. Uh, obviously, his contributions on the ice, while they were more the nitty-gritty things off the score sheets, uh, you know, he was certainly a, a classy player and someone who was willing to, to obviously put his body and face on the line for the Flyers organization. Um, so he is certainly special, but he is also a certain kind of special in his job role as a coach at any capacity. He is dog shit. Dollar to the sword jar. Um, but we don't have to worry about that anymore, as we now have, as you mentioned, Michelle Terry and Mike Yo. Um, so Philadelphia uh, Flyers Twitter is a, a hell of a place, Connor. We sit here and, and at any given moment we can scroll through and we can say, you know, we need to shake everything up. You know, everyone's got to go. Everyone's got to go. So almost everyone goes and we still bitch. We don't like who they put in place. We don't like Mike Yo, uh, you know, because of what he was as a head coach. We don't like Michelle Terry and because of his attitude and all of the antics that he brings. But when it all comes, push comes to shove, and these decisions have now been finalized, and the, and the coaching staff and the bench for the Philadelphia Flyers is now in place and intact, I'm left wondering what is there really to bitch about. So let's get your take here on the Philadelphia Flyers uh, as a whole for, for that new and revamped coaching staff. 
First of all, I, I got to touch on the point about uh, Philly Twitter. I, I don't think there are very many cities where you can actually dedicate a show to Twitter takes in all four sports like where you're so privileged to because of all the <laughs> takes and the impulsive ridiculous. attitude that comes out of Twitter in Philadelphia. But uh, otherwise, uh, I, I really like, I agree with you. I really like the decisions. I actually think there's a ton of experience coming from these three people. They've all, it all includes turning around teams. They've all turned around teams. And just as any coach will have it, their time comes where they have to move on. Michelle Terrian turned teams around. His time came where he had to move on. Same with Mike Gill. Same with Alan Vienno. They're the same. It's all the same. It happens. It's a coaching life cycle. Um, Yo's experience was shifting from dump and chase and taking advantage of offensive defensemen is huge. And I think it's it's undervalued. And I don't think that I don't think that Twitter looked into what Mike Yo brings to the game of hockey. They just kind of look at the team that he had and don't realize that. Ivan Provorov and Shane Goss's bear will become That's machines. my biggest take. Yeah, that, that to me, when you and I talked about that prior, uh, I don't know if it was via text or message or whatever the hell we were doing, but you had mentioned that, and I had myself not looked into specifically the things that Mike Yo does bring. And one name immediately came to mind, and it was right now Philadelphia Flyers Twitter. Another punching bag for them is Shane Goss's bear because of the down year. And Mike Yo might be exactly what he needs. So I, I love your point to that. I agree. I agree. I think it's huge on who the puck is Ryan Dingle. We, we talked about it last <laughs> week. It, 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 it was a huge, huge point that we made. And Terry, he just like, he's known for turning teams around. Uh, although he's exploited offenses at the expense of his goaltending. Are we not used to that in Philadelphia? Have we not witnessed that enough? At least he's not for the, the last two coach. decades. Exactly. Exactly. At least, at least he's not the head coach who's going to do that. I personally think that it's a good combination of coaches and where there's weaknesses in the coaching staff, there's someone who can kind of lift them up. You have Mike Yo, who's defensive minded. He's going to work with the defenseman. He's going to hopefully turn that penalty kill into, you know, one that can actually kill penalties. And Terry, and hopefully he can get the offense running and, and get the most out of whoever's going to be on the roster next year. My take on this is Vienno will, will bring the strength of these two assistant coaches together and lead the Flyers into the NHL playoffs next year. How far? I don't, I don't even want to guess. I don't think we're Stanley Cup ready yet by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't think we're as far off as Flyers Twitter might think. So I'll be honest, when the when the names begin to be announced and we all got those alerts as, as to who is now going to be manning, uh, manning the bench, you know, obviously at that point, they had yet to, to give specific roles. We were just told Flyers have added Mike Yo, they've added uh, Michelle Terrian and no blocks gone. Um, and uh, dude who I'm blanking on his name went back into retirement. Um, but uh you know, I, I sat there and my immediate reaction is to, to go to the things that we, we already know. We knew that we wanted neither of them as head coaches. And that was the thing that kind of fueled that instant kind of aggression and anger. Um, you know, and just, you know, you, you, you have to train yourself to be a little patient and to sit there and say, you know what? No, let me dive into some of this. Let's see what they do bring because they're not controlling a whole hockey team. They're controlling a part of it. Uh, and you mentioned that on who the puck is Ryan Dingle. Um, you know, you mentioned it again tonight. You know, these these guys do bring specific things. And the thing that I'm actually most most looking forward to is we've we've just had to, to endure four year four plus years of uh, a really really lifeless coaches room and a lifeless bench. You know, it wasn't until that that final year here of Hackstall where we began to see frustration from him. You know, we began to see him you know arguing with refs you know from time to time. You know, pulling players aside you know on the bench and it wasn't always the most animated, but it was more than we had in Philadelphia. You know, we we live for the emotion that that is attached with the skill sets. You know, we live for the personality that that's delivering these messages. And that's that's, again, making these people seem human, which none of us could connect to the Dave Hackstalls of the world or, or anyone on his coaching staff because we didn't speak to any of them. One thing that the three of these guys in particular bring, they are funny. 
they have personality and they are not going to take any kind of crap from any of these players. You know, you, you saw the way that, that Michelle Terry and, you know, kind of in a way, you know, forced some superstars out, uh, you know, of, of their time, um, you know, and then the way that he treated some of the veterans, you know, I think it was you that had mentioned the Danny Briere thing. Um, you know, you, you take a look at some of that and in today's hockey and today's sports, you need coaches who are willing to do that. And then more importantly, you need players who are willing to receive that. Um, you know, and I think that coming from a really, really lifeless locker room, uh, this is something I'm most excited to see is can this marriage work? Can today's kind of soft NHL, soft player minded player, uh, player minded individuals, can they respond to, to being chewed out and to being held accountable, which is something that they were never held to before, or at least not something that we as fans could, could sit there and dive into. So I'm most excited for those particular things. And then again, you know, hearing, you know, your part in, uh, in who the puck is Ryan Dingle to, to go ahead and then challenge myself to then look further into the pros and cons of each one of those people uh, that are now going to be behind the bench at, and you can start to, you know, as, as I mentioned, you start to see the pieces kind of work. You understand that, that you can maximize a Shane Gostasper's talent. You, know, you can maximize uh, Travis Sanheim, who really exploded in the second half uh, under Gordon. You know, you're going to maximize Phil Myers because he, he's another, you know, potentially strong two-way defenseman. You know, it, there's a lot to be excited about with with this coaching staff. It's, it's, you're going to have to go in cautious because you don't know how these guys are going to respond. But I'm excited about it. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, I don't think that our players are necessarily weak when it comes to getting that type of treatment. They've just never had it. One guy who would concern me might be Jake Voracek. Otherwise, I think a lot of them, they're young. They they're, they're, they can still be kind of molded the way that the coach wants, and they'll be able to put up with that type of treatment. And that, that would be what my hope is. But, I mean, I, I, I'm excited. I generally think that it's going to be a good year for the Flyers. And I think there's going to be a big turnaround. Like, the, the issue we have with our offensive defensemen is that they're too offensive in some cases. And they just seem to be trained in how to be good enough offensively that they don't necessarily have to worry about the defense. And I think Mike Yo has a, might have the experience necessary to – really turn that around and like not having to watch a Flyers game where all we do is dump and chase a puck if they can implement some of Yo's shift away from that and kind of work it up through the neutral zone without turnovers which means more than likely under Mike Yo's defense we don't see McDonald in a Flyers jersey again um, but those are the types of things I'm excited for just like you I'm excited to see how the players respond and I'm excited to see more how the defense is going to respond to Mike Yo less about the offense. I mean, I know we have the firepower on offense. It's just we got to come more naturally using it. Yeah, I, again, I, I think if you control the things that you need to control first and in your particular position, and if you're a defenseman, if you're playing a, a sound defensive game, if you're forcing turnovers, if you're forcing difficult passes and, and you're – Doing the the right fundamental things as as a defenseman, you don't realize how much you can truly utilize, uh, you know, then turning that into offense. You know, we see it in in the NBA. You know, your your defense does does translate to to fast paced offensive play and the creativity and the dangles and things like that. We'll have that back again with these coaches if the players buy into to what system will be implemented. Another thing that and you kind of touched on it there, you know, is the fact that, you know, the the dump and chase is such a sorry and played out, you know, kind of mentality. I'm really looking forward to controlled zone entries, you know, and to to fluently moving through the neutral zone. You know, this is something that I don't know if, if you are, are the same way, but you know, I sit here and, you know, I watch, you know, hockey on, on the East Coast here and you know, I'm watching all the seven o'clock games and whatever's on TV at the time. And everyone looks so much more crisp with the puck. You know, their their movement, it's assertive, it's decisive, and it makes them look so much faster than the Philadelphia Flyers and so much more competent with the puck and without the puck. Then you go and you watch West Coast hockey, and it's now the same thing. West Coast hockey used to be just a bunch of bruisers. You know, they were they were the, the side of hockey that failed to translate to the speed transition that the East Coast really, really kind of brought in with teams like the Pittsburgh Penguins. 
That's what the West Coast does now, too. And they do that, again, with this decisive puck movement. You know, that there isn't this just loose play and hope to God for the physicality along the boards, you know, to, to regain possession of a puck that you already had possession of. I'm so excited for, for this revamped or potential revamped uh, just puck movement and puck control for the Philadelphia Flyers with both coaches really now in place. You make a good point there because – I think as fans, we all too often think, and I'm, I'm definitely notorious for it, saying, holy shit, the Flyers are slow. But I think it's exactly <laughs> what you said there. That I think it's it's all about just changing. It's all about how we play. It's all about how we move the puck up the ice. If all we do is dump and chase, and then the guys who chase get slammed into the boards, and that's, the, that's it. Of course we look slow because we're just doing the same thing over and over again. I, again, to me, sloppy play, you know, makes you look slower because you, you're, you, again, you, you think about it, your skates are constantly stopping and you're constantly having to, to pick up from from basically neutral. You're, you're not going to be able to just snap in to, to speed succession. It just doesn't work. You know, think about it even as something as simple as driving a car. You know, if, if you're if you're already at 35 miles an hour and you need to get to 70, just hit the gas pedal and you're there. But if you got to go from zero to 70, zero to 60, zero to 90, whatever the number may be, I mean, you got a little get up to go, you know, and, and that's, you're choppy right now. The Philadelphia Flyers are choppy. They're sloppy, you know, and finding some, some true identity with the puck and some smooth movements without it, it's going to create different passing lanes that the rest of the NHL has already put into their systems. And the Flyers are going to finally catch up to that. You know, I think gone are the times now. And again, Chuck Fletcher, a guy outside the organization, Elaine Vigneault, you know, a guy outside the organization. Now, Yo and Terry and you know, you're you are bringing in people who are willing to adapt to this game in a way that the Philadelphia Flyers for the last two or three decades have been so unwilling to do. The Broad Street Bullies are dead. And now. This is the new era and the new style of hockey. You mentioned it right at the forefront of this particular taken segment. The Philadelphia Flyers <clears throat> have now three coaches who, who are willing to sit here and adapt to the new age. And that's something to be excited about. Um, so closing out on the Philadelphia Flyers topic, Connor, let's get your, your final take here on the actual state of the Philadelphia Flyers coaching staff and what you're believing going into next season. I think that this is the, the best that the coaching staff's been in a while, as, as much as people may not want to admit it, as much as fans don't want to admit it. I think they have to see the product on the ice for what it is. And like I said, the, the three of them together, they all have weaknesses, but they all, I believe, have different weaknesses. And so that'll make it so that the three of them can work together to make a strong team that I think is going to return to the NHL playoffs next season. So I think we're in a good spot and it's just the change of, of the, the change that the fans demanded to, to move out of the organization and to, to, to go hire some results, to bring new faces, to cha- really change. And now they're sitting there and they're all scared because we're, they're actually changing. But I think it, I, when all said and done, I think a few grown pains to start the season will end in a playoff, at least a playoff appearance this, next year. So I, I'm going to double down on on your your take on, on this take here. I, again, I will be the first to admit that I was not on that side of things when the initial report came out. And we, again, had yet to know the roles of these individuals. Um but, you know, again, upon listening to, to Who the Puck is Ryan Dingle, which is a lesson for everyone if you want to be educated in Philadelphia Flyers hockey, you should listen to that show. Rob hosts a great show, and we're, we're happy to have Connor uh, on that show more now as well. And Steve, well, Steve blew his knee out, so he's got nothing better to do than to talk hockey. It's a really, really good segment. Um, you know, and for me in particular this week, as I was not on that segment, listening to it, challenged me to then go ahead and look a little bit further into the strengths and weaknesses of each of these coaches here and to to begin to buy in a little bit more. So I, what I would say is my final thought here is that I am cautiously optimistic um, and I am most curious to see how these players respond to a very, very different coaches room than what Philadelphia has seen in some time. Philadelphia Eagles, 
we're going to move into to some birds talk here. So um, I believe you and Al have a, a Kelly Green Hour coming up soon, correct? Yep. Tomorrow we're going to be hosting a Kelly Green Hour, and and we're actually going to talk about probably these two guys we're going to, about to talk about. Perfect. So again, if you guys don't listen to our uh, our segment for the Kelly Green Hour, uh, Connor and L do a a great Philadelphia Eagles show. It's actually probably our, our strongest segment. I, I can't even lie. Uh, they are the most researched individuals of, of the group uh, and they do a really, really nice job. So be sure to subscribe to our show and, and to, to keep a lookout for those Kelly Green hours, especially as we now near the NFL season. Um, but for two Philadelphia Eagles uh, in particular, this is a crucial and critical season. Uh, those two are Sidney Jones and Derek Barnett. Let me see if I can find the tweet here that we had. Unless you have it up with me or with you right now. Let me see where I got. There we go. From uh, from Brian Schwartz, uh, which is a non-blue checkmark member. We always appreciate that. Uh, but the Eagles have no ideal fit for their first two picks in the 2017 draft class. Derek, uh, Derek Barnett and Sidney Jones both can play. Those two players absolutely need to break out in 2019. So you mentioned that you guys are going to probably talk about the two of these players and individuals uh, in the Kelly Green Hour, but we're going to take a look into this take as well. So being as that you are part of the Kelly Green Hour, why don't you give us your take here on both Derek Barnett and Sidney Jones? Well, I absolutely agree with the tweet. Um, I I find that more for Sidney Jones, I think it's a lot more crucial for Sidney Jones because he hasn't been able to come back fully from an injury yet. He hasn't been able to play a full season for us yet. I I really think that if Jones fails to deliver due to the depth at the cornerback position on the roster, the Eagles may be forced to maybe not consider moving on. I don't want to say move on, but probably consider moving on. There's so much depth. We got like six cornerbacks that are all vying for spots and we can't take any more than six on guaranteed even moving some to safety you can't carry that many cornerbacks when yeah, and with some play. of the safety additions that that spot doesn't exactly have you know too much availability either absolutely definitely not as open as it was before Sendejo and and others that came along so I mean, there's not as much flexibility to move him there, so it'll be the odd man out usually, and it might be a tough decision to make because we know how Howie loves his trenches, so he's not going to keep six, seven cornerbacks on roster and four safeties. So unfortunately, that might be a decision that comes. So I think it's an extremely crucial year for Jones. Barnett, I'm very high on Barnett. I'm a huge Barnett fan. I, I think we've seen out of him, if he can be healthy, I think he will be our lead defensive end as Brandon Graham ages. Barnett is someone we can look to. I mean, we saw in the Super Bowl game, Derek Barnett, part of the, all, all the infamous strip sack. Um, I love that I, play, by the way. Absolutely. One of it my was favorite so cool. plays yeah, in Eagles history. Yeah, you sit there and you look at, at really the, a player who started this entire process of the, of the Philadelphia Eagles there you know, with that draft pick that we all wanted, Earl Thomas. You know, a guy who had to fight his way to being, you know, not only embraced by his own team and coaching staff, but embraced by the city. And then he does and he becomes uh, a truly dominant force on the edge there. And, you know, to me, it was it was cool. You know, rookie year, Derek Barnett. And, and you got Brandon Graham, the, the guy who he's eventually going to take his position from stripping that ball. And you got Barnett recovering. I just always thought it was super cool not to cut you off there. But that's just one of my favorite no, plays I, in I, Eagle I, history. I agree. I agree. And I love Barnett. Like, I think he's an extremely underrated piece, but I believe he's underrated more for the reason that he has been injured. He is a person who we haven't probably seen the full potential, but I think Barnett's really going to come out this year. I think he's someone who's going to take a massive step forward this year. As for Jones, he's got to be healthy. For Jones, it's not, it's forget how crucial it is to perform he needs to prove he can be healthy, and hopefully this offseason he's getting a full offseason of healthy working out. And, like, I guess my big take on this is how he is always looking for that next weapon. And at any point, a pick or a free agent could jump anyone on the depth chart, as we're seeing this year. Who knows where some of these people are going to land on the depth chart at, once they go through the offseason workouts. So I, I think that every year is vital for a young player on a rookie contract because Howie Roseman will move on in the snap of a finger. So you have to be very careful. He, I think the thing saving Sidney Jones right now is the injury 
and the fact that he was a first-round talent taken in the second round. That's the thing saving him. If this guy was a sixth or seventh-round pick, I don't necessarily think he'd be as safe as he is right now. Yeah, my take is almost a mirror thing of yours. You know, I, I don't, I don't fear this season for for Derek Barnett. I think that he's going to be an integral piece to to that defensive line as an edge rusher there for for years to come. Um, yeah, there's there's only so long that that these guys you know, are going to stay on the field in the capacity that they do. You know, we we've seen edge rushers. You know, like a Julius Peppers, you know, hang around forever, but they're playing 15 percent of the snaps. They may be crucial snaps, but they're no longer playing 75, 80 percent of those snaps. You know, and with the way that when healthy Jim Schwartz likes to utilize the rotations of those pieces, I just I, I can't see any way that he doesn't find himself in a really, really good position all year to succeed uh, as, as Derek Barnett. Um, so I don't fear that part of this equation at all. And I don't feel any pressure there. You know, I, I feel like there's, if anything, more pressure to, uh, to Josh Sweat, you know, a guy who, you know, you want to talk about a guy with potential. He's an athletic freak and his first move may be the best of anyone on that line uh, at any time. He is that quick. Um, and his hands are that fierce, but he's a guy who, who had a traumatic knee injury. Uh, and then again, finishing out last season hurt as well. You know, he's someone who, has so much upside, but that is the injury concern. He's the person I'd be more worried about losing it. And even though he was just drafted last year, he's a person that I would worry about first before I ever took a, a second to worry about Derek Barnett. You know, he, he, Absolutely. I, I agree with that one because Barnett, I think, is lining up on the other side of Graham. And yes. Graham and Barnett rush, and I don't think there's any way you can have someone, unless someone has the greatest offseason training camps in the history of the Eagles, I don't think anyone's jumping those two for the, that one-two depth spot. Correct, and I'm I'm very much in, in the same there. Um, you know, and again, and that's that's nothing against uh, it's nothing against Curry. He's a specialist. It's nothing against Chris Long. Which I, is he coming back? I, I don't even know. He hasn't even announced um, it yet, but I mean, he said prepare as if he's not coming back, and he he's gotten a little. Uh, Gotten a little mouthy on Twitter with fans who are, are looking for answers. I mean, I get it, but at the same time, we're 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 fine. I think we're fine at that edge spot, and it actually would open up opportunity for a guy like Sweat to be on the roster and to be that fourth or fifth guy in the rotation. So, absolutely, and that's kind of my my takeaway, you know, as well. So again, the, the Derek Barnett portion of this take, I don't fear. Sidney Jones, however. I know Sydney you Jones love is, Sydney Jones, so <laughs> I I am not as high on Sydney Jones as LJ is. LJ absolutely, you know, I, I'm still sure that he would build a secondary around him uh, if given the opportunity. Um, you know, to me, I, I as someone who has come back from numerous knee injuries myself. You know, I take a look at, and I realize, um, you know, again, obviously Sydney Jones with the Achilles, not the knee, but lower body, all the same. You know, there's a mental aspect to coming back, you know, and, you know, after your, you know, your first type of an injury, you know, the people respond one of two ways, you know, that they feel like they're invincible. And the second they can walk, they can run again. That was me. Well, I got hurt again. And then there's someone like Sidney Jones, who is a little more cautious. And, and you the the story that, that I kind of continue to reiterate is uh, the Carson Palmer story, you know, about his ACL and that, you know, it takes that full year. You know, and then it takes another year beyond that to mentally get over that. You know, so to me, this isn't this is this is the the year for Sidney Jones. We thought it was last year, you know, uh, you know, playing what just one week the the prior year, the Super Bowl year, uh, playing in week 17 there. But Sidney Jones, at some point, every single game is down on the field, holding his ankle in the air, and you just never know, and it, you can tell. He just doesn't trust it yet, whether he doesn't feel it physically where it feels strange still or if mentally, you know, there are certain sounds or, or certain twists or certain pops and certain things that occur, you know, while you're out there physically playing the game of football that he just can't get over in his brain and he believes that he's hurt. Either way, if he can't get over it this year. You hit the, the nail on the head here. The one thing that he has going for him is the fact that Jalen Mills 
is limited. We know exactly what he is, and so does the rest of the NFL. Sometimes he's going to make great plays. He's a very good tackler, but he is limited in what he can do. Rizal Douglas, you're very high on Rizal Douglas. I myself am not, but you said he graded out as actually our best cornerback. I remember that from several weeks ago. Um, yeah. You know, he is a guy that he is a true ball hawk, and there is always going to be a place for a risky player like that. I don't fear anything for him. Two of those guys are there. You know, then you have Ronald Darby, who is undoubtedly one of the most talented cornerbacks on the roster. Another one coming back from injury, back-to-back years with with pretty significant injuries. If he can stay healthy, while he also has some limitations, there's no way he's not starting on the outside as one player. Avante Maddox went back there, and Avante Maddox was seemed like he was phenomenal everywhere on the field that he played. It took him an, an adjustment period at each one of those positions, whether he was inside, outside, or safety. But when give it a game or two, he fit in and he was fine. That guy's safe. Then you have Craven LeBlanc, who worked himself in into to conversation for inside, outside, doesn't matter. Sidney Jones is a total unknown. There is too much talent in that defensive backs room for him to not come out here and just play with his hair on fire. To, to excuse the lame expression. But if this guy can't come up with it, he's going to find himself looking for a job somewhere else sooner rather than not. And that's crazy to think as a guy who was a t- potential top 10 pick two years ago. Yeah, like, I mean, it's so impressive. When when I saw the mock drafts that, that had us going cornerback, it made me laugh. I would have put any amount of money on no cornerbacks being taken in this year's draft. Because it's so deep. There's six or seven people, and you know that Howie's going to bring on a couple more for the training camps to fill out the 90-man roster. So it just amazed me that people just haven't given the time of day to these guys. Like Speaking of Rasul Douglas, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a picture posted. He's been working out like crazy all off season, and he went from having this like chubby-looking stomach to like a full-on six-pack. He looks like a monster athletic freak, so... Just gets Good, because he needed to work on that first step. Exactly, exactly. He's going to prove you guys wrong this year. But, I mean, that that cornerback room is just so, so deep. I think it's one of the deeper positions. It's just young. It's so young. It's so – some of them are so raw. You just – like, Jones, I fear for – the only thing that could save Jones is if Darby plays out of his mind and – he demands 12 to $15 million and leaves next off season. Then that might open the final spot for him again. And that might save him for the next year, but that would be probably one of the only ways. Yeah, how long can you keep playing that game? You, you, you can't keep, you know, if you're Sidney Jones, if, if you're a former t- top 10 potential pick and goes in the second round, you cannot enter every single training camp of your first of your rookie contract saying, well, shit, I'm only going to play, I'm only going to be you know, an integral part of this team if someone plays out of their mind well enough to exceed the contract dollars that Howie Roseman is going to be willing to go the next year. That's going to open up a spot. So maybe next year I can play or shit. I hope someone gets hurt and that way I'm going to be forced to go in and play. But shit, I might have to play inside. I'm not an inside cornerback. I'm not a nickelback. I got to be on the outside going in with all these different things right now that, that have to happen for him. I fear for this kid, man. I, I really do. I fear for him I ever being too. successful we, we in, him, in Philly. We give him everything to succeed. Look at Jalen Mills. He's a seventh round corner looking like oh, there, he was there, a, there's genuinely teams who are interested in in potentially trading for him. He's potential trade bait because if you have a the defensive line like we have, the pressure becomes so much less on on the cornerback. So we're giving Sidney Jones everything possible to if he has to play off to get comfortable with his knee you play off and then he can come up on the play like we we give him everything he needs and the way Craven LeBlanc showed up I fear for Sidney Jones's roster spot as well I think he's obviously going to make it because how do you give up on a first round talent that you drafted in the second round who's had injury issues like how can you give up that quickly but I mean Bound, we're bound to have to give up eventually if he doesn't just become comfortable with his knee. Like I said, if you if he has to play 10 yards off and come up on the play, so be it. Whatever he's got to do to get comfortable. But maybe he should do that during training camp. But he's got to figure it out somehow to, to like you said, get that mental game going. 
Yeah, well, I, I have two things on that. One, people continually say um, that uh, Jesus, blank on his name, Jalen Mills is a you know uh, he's a seventh round pick. Let's not forget, like he was probably a middle middle round pick if he didn't have all the off the field issues that he had. You know, so it's not as though that you know he's this nobody that that went in the seventh round. You know, on the final day of the draft, where where you're just saying, ah, I'll take you know whoever the hell's here. You know, he was a talented kid. You know, he played well in LSU. He again, his his biggest thing is the fact that he's, you know, he's not really a cornerback. Like he should be a safety in the NFL. You know, it just works out that, and you mentioned it. You know, the, the strength of of our defensive line and, and the way that we like to try to to force pressure. You know, it, quick decisions with the with the football. Almost every one of our cornerbacks, I have the utmost, including Sidney Jones. I have the utmost, just complete respect and trust that they're going to make the play so long as our front four is getting pressure. I, I, every single, every route that's going to be run, every corner that we have is going to be there and hang with them for the first move of that route. It's the secondary moves. It's when they break out, you know, to, to, again, all the things that we double move or or the double moves that all of our corners bite on, you know, those are the things that, that we begin to get exposed because we essentially have six of the same, kind of corners that just more or less some know how to tackle and some don't know how to tackle more or less correct um you know and again it's another way that you can sit there and continue to make the arguments for some of these guys moving to safety and you know there's a lot's been made about you know the the malcolm jenkins thing um you know obviously you know he he's the he's the leader of this defense um you know you, you want him to to finish his career here um, but how much longer is he going to go, you know, and, and then uh, McLeod, you know, re-upping, um, you know, but he's another guy coming off an, a, a knee injury in, in his own right. You know, that there's the very real possibility that that contract is is going to be, you know, done after this year. You know, so some of these guys may hang around in another position capacity. You know, the guys like Jalen Mills, you know, the guys like Rizul Douglas, if, if he doesn't, you know, t- turn into a cornerback or an every down cornerback, you know, maybe he goes to safety. Both guys played, you know, him at West Virginia. And, and again, uh, uh, Jalen Mills and, and LSU, both guys had, had time at safety. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of interesting things, you know, but, but to get down to, to the, the, the point of this take, you know, of the two of those players, I would say that it, it, don't waste your waste your breath and, and your stress on fearing whether or not Derek Burnett's going to fit in. He will. You, you mentioned it. It's it's him and, and Graham on either side uh, and behind him are, are guys that one who may not be be an eagle, may not be in the NFL. Another one who can't stay on the field and another one who is a one trick pony in Vinnie Curry. There's nothing to fear there. But Sidney Jones. That that is something to follow. That's a storyline to follow all throughout camp. It's a storyline to follow throughout four weeks of the preseason. It's a storyline to sit there and see where he is on the opening week depth chart. It'll be a sad day for Al if he gets cut or he's not going to get cut. He ends up at the very bottom of the depth chart and is given a little opportunity. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if you get a mysterious Mac Collins, you know, where, where uh, his hammy is a little tight opening week. We're going to we're going to hold him out and then, ah, uh, shit, we're going to IL him or, you know, IR him, um, you know, and steal a year that way. It would be a shame, but it would be a shame. I would not be I would not be surprised with the depth that we have. I don't think that they would do it with him, but it wouldn't shock me if a guy like Craven LeBlanc, you know, goes down with an injury that's, you know, it's bad, but not terrible enough that he would miss the full season, but the Eagles would exercise the option to do so, to control both players. You want to um, keep him, exactly. He's not like a practice squad position here. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, before we move into some Philadelphia Phillies takes here, uh, official stance here for you on, on the Jones and Barnett. Are we both pretty much in the same? Fear nothing with Barnett, fear everything with Jones? Absolutely. Like I said, every year is vital for a young player and how he's always looking for that next weapon. So all it takes is him drafting a third round cornerback who really shows up in in training camp to potentially push a Jones out of the way. So Jones has to be very careful. Uh, yeah, could not agree uh, agree more with with any part of that. 
Um, you know, so again, uh, if you want to hear more on that topic and, and more on any Philadelphia Eagles topic, be sure to listen to the Kelly Green Hour with LJ and with Connor. They will dive into that and so much more this week and every week after that as we are nearing, mercifully nearing, the NFL season. Uh, going to move into now the Philadelphia Phillies take. Uh, we we have so many different things that we could be talking about with the with the Philadelphia Phillies, um, but we're choosing to to go into a piece now that, that we we on this show haven't actually broken into yet. Um, so a guy named Dave on Twitter goes, "Get Kimbrel. This is just one game, but you can see it's going to be a, an issue in key games. You just know it." And I, the way I know this is a real take and the way that I know that this is a real thing is because when I read this, I have no goddamn idea what game he's talking about because the bullpen has imploded on numerous occasions. And whether that be through the usage uh, of, uh, of Gabe Kapler, whether it be just guys just getting cold at, at times where it's not really great to get cold at, you know, or, or injuries, you know, this, this bullpen right now has faced its share of troubles and, and concerns. Um, there are also guys like uh, an Adam Morgan that so, so long as Sir Anthony Dominguez is not following him as he did today, uh, you know, his ERA is, is pretty ridiculous. Um, you know, but let's get your take here on the Philadelphia Phillies bullpen as a whole. Are, are you as, as pressed as Philadelphia Twitter is and is obsessed with the idea of going out and signing someone like Craig Kimbrell? No, I mean, first of all, I think Kimbrell's overpriced. The guy's waiting on a $20 million a year contract that, let's face it, is never going to come. No team is going to pay $20 million for a guy heading towards the wrong side of 30 and pitches you one in in every couple of nights, two times a week, three times a week. It just doesn't make sense. Um, I, I mean, I did some digging into the bullpen numbers, and it must be a hell of a year in bullpens in the majors because we actually ranked as the 10th best bullpen in the majors. Yeah, they're but not terrible. They're, 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 they're by no means terrible. Terrible, I, but but I, I get where this where Dave's coming from and the, the thoughts that you know implosion could be the issue. Although right now implosion of our bullpen is probably back in the back of everybody's mind when we look at how the offense is playing. But <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, it's an above average bullpen, and I don't. And I think one of the biggest things right now is the injury problems. I mean, the Robertson is still out, and news came out. I think that he's going to miss another two to two to three weeks. Like yes. they, that, that was our biggest sign, and that's the guy who was supposed to help the bullpen. They were putting him in a position as closer that I don't personally think he he should be in. I don't think he's a closer. Um, and maybe when he gets back and we solidify more alongside Morgan. Maybe the bullpen does get even better than 10th best in the league. So, I mean, we are in the top third of the league as far as a bullpen perspective goes. The fact that people want to go and fork over $20 million a year for the next, and he wants long term. So for the next three to five years is is ridiculous. I think it's it's crazy. Uh, wow. I, think we need, I think we need to address the depth of our starters to support our pen. Our pen. I don't think Kimbrell will ever be the solve for our bullpen issues. And he definitely won't be the solve for monetary issues in the future. Well, I would just like to call the attention to uh, one of the last big name closers that signed a a relatively lucrative deal. And that is one Jonathan Papelbon by the Philadelphia Phillies. And had we not signed his dumb ass, we would not have acquired the next Cy Young winner for the Philadelphia Phillies. And Nick Pavetta. So all I'm saying is if you want to get the next Cy Young winner in a trade, you go ahead and you overpay, or overpay for Kimbrell. And then you trade him to a desperate, dumbass team like like someone in your own division in the Nationals. I sadly um, don't think that there's a team that dumb because don't you think he'd be signed by now if there was a team that dumb to, well, to overpay? this is my sarcastic tone. Don't sign Kimbrell. This guy is you said it wrong. He's nearing 30. You know, he's the wrong side of his 20s here. He's a guy who's declined each of the last couple of years. Everyone sits there and, and has that that sliver of thought because two years ago he was really, really damn good. You know, but the two years prior to that, not so much. Last year, certainly not so much. And again, he's living in this delusional state of mind right now. If he truly believes that anyone 
anyone is going to pay him 20 plus million dollars a year for three to five years. If you want to make 20 million dollars, you sign just this year. Someone will pay you 20 million dollars this year just on a chance that could happen. But to expect that for three to five years. And, and again, as you said, said, you know, he's a guy who's going to pitch a handful of times a week. You know, get the hell out of here. You know, to, to me, I feel like in the Philadelphia Phillies case specifically, you know, we have this rare luxury right now is that we have two starters who are not starting pitchers. You know, I, I jokingly mentioned the Cy Young, Nick Pavetta. Now, I still believe Nick Pavetta may very well be at some point in his career a very, very good starting pitcher. People all across baseball believed it. People all across the organization were saying, hey, expect big things from Pavetta this year. What Brett Myers had to close games at one point in his career. I think it was 2007. Came back to the starting rotation in 2008. Pitched like shit. Got sent down. Took it like a champ. Came back. Was an integral part. Was the game two starter throughout all the the, the entire uh, World Series run for for the Philadelphia Phillies. He was able to do that. Who's to say that this couldn't be 2007 for Nick Pavetta? That hey, you have a power arm. You can throw two pitches. We need your ass in the bullpen for us. Maybe he's a long guy and give you two, three innings because he's already stretched out. Maybe he's a specialty guy and you say, hey, you're only pitching in the seventh or eighth inning every single night that we need you to. And then beyond that, you have Vince Velasquez, who has no business being in anyone's starting rotation all across baseball. I was very against him going to the bullpen. He's terrible. I was very against him going to the bullpen because I've never believed in Vince Velasquez as a pitcher himself. But when you dive into it, Vince Velasquez is kind of a perfect bullpen piece. First time through the order, people don't really figure him out. This allows him to then use his fastball almost exclusively. And since he's so goddamn unwilling to use any other pitch in his arsenal, even when the best catcher in the game with the best game plan in baseball calls it, put his ass in the bullpen. What a joke that game was. That was atrocious, and I'm glad that that he owned up to that afterwards. I'm glad JT called him out on it afterwards. It's shit that you need to hear. And if again, if if it's any indication this team's not messing around and they want to win, they sent the guy down in, in Nick Pavetta, who said, you know, hey, three four starts in, into the, a year that everyone thought was going to be a massive jump for him. They said, go figure this shit out. They didn't want to waste any more time in the big leagues, and they brought in Eikhoff, who's been except for the other night, excellent, and since he's returned. Vince Velasquez goes to the IL with forearm strain. That guy's never seen the rotation as a Philadelphia Philly ever again. So that could be your Kimbrel. I'm not saying he by any means is going to be Kimbrel at Kimbrel's peak, but I'm saying that if you pay 20 some million dollars a year for Kimbrel right now, you're going to get a guy who's going to need time to get himself in game shape. Who's going to need time to work himself back into what the feel of a major league game again. And a guy who has sucked in September and October over, except for two years ago, over the last three, four years. Why do you want to pay for them? So, Dave, I don't understand what the hell you're looking at here on, on this tweet. You know, I'm, I'm confused as to what, why you want to go into that first tax, first round of tax penalties, that first year of tax penalties for an asshole like that. I don't need Kimberl on that. I shouldn't say asshole. I don't know the guy. But a garbage pitcher right now, why do you want to do that? That just doesn't make any damn like sense. Like I said, I'd rather, I'd rather invest in, in the starters. If you really want to go and invest $20 million, go and invest in, in Keuchel. If you really want to invest – and have it be worth your money. Go and invest in Keiko for a year. He he's he's all he he pitches simulated games every week. He'll be more ready than Kimbrel because I don't even know if Kimbrel's still alive. You hear no updates about Craig Kimbrel. It's like th- he's done. It's like he's disappeared off the earth. So I mean, like like you said, I, I agree. Like the last kids could come back and be a great bullpen arm. Pavetta could be a bullpen arm. We just have so many flexible options. I mean, we had Irvin come up now. Like there's just so many flexible options along our start and front that we could use some stretch guys who, I mean, take, for example, I mean, maybe a poor example, but kind of like be a genie in Toronto who he can pitch stretch time. He's terrible. His ERA's through the roof. <laughs> but at least he gives you that arm that if you go four innings and get blown up, he can go out and throw you two or three innings. Maybe it that's something difference. like a Pavetta or a Velazquez could do. In t- yeah, in today's game, the, the way that, that starting pitching works now, you, there are so few guys who are going to give you seven plus a night, even few guys that are going to give you six plus a night. You know, bullpen, there, there's a reason now that, that these bullpens are, are – 
the command the amount of roster spaces on an active 25 day spot that 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 it commands there's a reason for it because these starters now you may have one or two guys in your rotation every time through who go six innings or more maybe for the most part guys are going four five innings somewhere in that five and two thirds somewhere in that range that's a lot of of innings these guys got to pitch and these guys don't get four days off in between you know these guys have got to be ready to go basically night in and night out you know there's so few nishaks out there who are refusing to pitch on on back-to-back days which again early on in the season nishak was certainly doing um not just a shot at him but there is there is value to a two to three inning guy like take uh, Aaron Nola the other night through what three innings three innings gave up three runs that's Tatton you're now taxing the bullpen you know your your ace of your staff goes three innings he didn't pitch so terribly that you're out of the ball game he only gave up three runs now imagine if you put a Nick Pavetta or a Vince Velasquez who could give you three four innings out of the pen one time through the lineup, both guys have some success going through a lineup once. Vince Velasquez more than Nick Pavetta on that first time through. But now you're still in a winnable ball game that your ace was removed after three freaking innings. There's value to them in the bullpen right there. And that means that you did not just use Hector Neris, Sir Anthony Dominguez, and Adam Morgan in meaningless fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh inning roles when you need them in the eighth and ninth. To me... Your bullpen can be fixed internally right now, you know, especially if Tommy Hunter and, and David Robinson come back and are, are OK. You know, it's, I don't fear the bullpen like you. Uh, L will like this as I agree with him right now. Obviously, the, you know, the starting rotation for me is uh, is something certainly more uncertain than our bullpen. Um, our bullpen, when it chooses to be bad, is very, very bad. Um, but, you know, you mentioned, you know, 10th in baseball right now. You can't really complain. No, not at all. If you're complaining about the 10th best bullpen, you're going to have a hell of a time getting to be the number one bullpen. You'll probably complain when we're number one, too. Oh, absolutely. Because and even in a number one bullpen in baseball, there's always there's always an Alvarez who every time he comes in, you have to hold your breath and say, damn it, this is definitely going to go badly because every bullpen's got one. Um, Absolutely. So, you can't be perfect across the board or you'd be investing more in a bullpen than the rest of your roster. Which I'm not totally against in today's baseball. I'm all for building a super pen. It worked out really well for teams like the Yankees and, and teams like, uh, well, who the hell else did it recently? Um, uh, the Cubs did it, you know, in their year. Uh, you're having Chapman, Davis, uh, and someone else I'm blanking on right now. Um you know, the Indians have done it. You, know, you can build a super pen and be a damn near dominant team. Um, you know, it's just unfortunately, I think we've invested too heavily on offense with a strikeout machine and Bryce Harper. And McCutcheon oh, take it easy. <laughs> Jesus. I uh, look, we, we just talked about that in, in, uh, in cap, we trust segment here. You know, we, we debated the day off for, for Bryce and, you know, and real quick, we'll get your take on it since you brought it up. The Bryce Harper thing. Um, two parts. One are, are, do you believe this is, is what Bryce Harper is and and that he's not going to amount to anything more and that he's never going to come out of that stretch uh, or that slump that he's in? Um, and two, would you give him a day off? I would absolutely give him a day off if it's, if it's needed, it's needed. I mean, you can't expect a guy to go out and play 162 games a year. That's just, that's like, the way we treat our goalies in Philadelphia. You're just asking for a, a long-term injury to come out of that. Um, but in, in regards to the other question, um, no, I think he'll come out of this slump. I mean, he, this is exact, it, not to this extreme last year, but he started similarly last year. And it's the same as all the people who are reacting to the Joey Votto thing. I think Votto comes out of it. I think Harper comes out of it baseball is a game it's a game of streaks it's a game of hot and cold and you're bound to get some cold and sometimes the cold as we've seen with Bryce Harper is ice cold for weeks on end and then he'll come out of it and he'll bring that average up into the 260 270 range and everyone will be cheering for him again I have no doubts 
Yeah. Again, I, I feel like people misunderstand what baseball is, you know, and, and I think you've actually mentioned it a handful of times, you know, on this segment as well, you know, but again, you're, you're, you're sitting here and you're cheering a guy on. If you think about it this way, you know, if you fail seven out of 10 times, you're still one of the best players in baseball. That's, that's just such a weird, funny game, you know, and the difference between, you know, failing seven times and hitting 300 and hitting 250 may amount to being like 15 hits, you know, like it, it, it's not this mass. It, it's if something falls your way, great. If something doesn't, all right. Like Jake Arrieta doesn't get any help from defense and, and shifts. And he, he has not in his entire time in Philadelphia. If he gets some help, if he gets some better defense, maybe he's not going through the type of stretch that he's going through right now, going through the stretches that he went through. Same thing at the play for Bryce Harper, you know, and then it, even funnier to think if you fail six times out of 10, six times out of 10, you're the best who's ever done it. Make sense out of that. If anyone does fantasy baseball, it is probably out of the four major sports, the world's most frustrating fantasy sport. Because I sit there and a batter goes like three for 10 in a week. And you're like, well, fuck that sucks for my numbers, but he's a 300 hitter. Yep. So think of that. That's three games, and he's a 300 hitter if he only hits three times at, in 10 at bats. It's the world's most frustrating sport, or uh, world's most frustrating fantasy sport, I think. Because I sit there, I'm like, one for four, that's not that good. But I'm like, actually, that's not that bad. That's a yeah. 250 bat in average. That's pretty good. I like that. Yeah, it's again for, for the for the. I think baseball is something, and actually, LJ hit on this in Incap We Trust. Um, and it does kind of lend to the actual point of of this whole Phillies take of would you or would you not get uh, you know get Kimbrel. There is the game today is so misunderstood because for so many people it's background noise. That's that's what LJ is, you know says you know for even for him you know a guy who who is very sports driven. Baseball of all the sports is certainly something that is far easier to just kind of have in the background. You know it's not something that that, that so many people are just committed. To, to watching pitch one to, to the 27th out recorded, you know, in, in a ball game, you know, and, and because of things like that and because the patience isn't there in today's society for a game as special as baseball, you do choose to take a look at the snapshots. And for some people, the snapshot is looking specifically at Bryce Harper's average and saying, this guy's hitting 215. And what they failed to do is to take one step further and say, I wonder what the guy behind him's hitting who was having a career year up until the last week and a half where he's finally hitting a cold streak. But he doesn't, but Reese Hoskins doesn't hit that mark. Reese Hoskins is not an MVP caliber player without Bryce Harper in front of him. You know, so to sit there and say that he's a waste is impossible to me. I'm with you. The guy deserves a day off. You know, I'm not saying that that's the, the fix it answer for everything and for everyone, but your body breaks down, you know, and he's a guy who we do. We've seen it. His defense right now, he is laying out for anything and everything. He, you know, he, he has his money now. He doesn't, he's not playing for a con. You saw that last year where, where he really let up on some balls and he let some things drop in because you need to stay healthy and get yourself a contract. He's got his guaranteed 330 million from this city. And he sees how the city respects him for the, how hard he plays night in and night out. Well, you, if you can't go out there and play that physical of a, of a baseball game in a position that's not overly physical out there in right freaking field and not expect a day off here and there. I think it's unrealistic to play a guy like that 162 games a year. Um, Absolutely. But, in Philadelphia sports, we, we should know it best by now based on the Joel Embiid situation, the goalie situation where we used eight goalies this year in, in, for the Flyers. You got to give people days off. You just have to. I mean, the the NBA playoffs might have ended a bit different for the Sixers had it not been for some terrible decisions by Brown to play Embiid in pointless games or to play him for stretches of games that he got played for. So uh, same thing could come up for Bryce Harper. You just you don't know. So, I mean, give him, give him the day off. I mean, sure, the fans will probably – light up twitter which would make for another great crossing borders episode but i mean <laughs> give him so what give him give the guy a day off we all need days off just because it's like well they're doing a sport i'd love to do a sport i bet you would want a day off in a sport just like you want your day off from work on the weekend 
Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And the point that I made about it, you know, was uh, during a cap we trust segment earlier in the evening uh, tonight was you know, even high school kids who, who who do freaking nothing need to take a mental health days. Now, high school kids literally call their parents and say, Mom, Dad, I'm just super stressed out from school. I really just need the day to myself. I need to just be at home and unwind. And they're like. Okay, Jimmy or Bobby or whatever, that seems reasonable. You've had a stressful existence. Well, they get days off. Athletes do not. You know, it's it's not that way. Or, well, that's how they're treating Bryce Harper. Athletes today, they do. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not unreasonable for, for him to get time off. You know, Rob had mentioned it earlier today that it was a perfect day to give him a day off. It was game three of this series, you know, after going into the wall twice the night before. You know, give him the day. Um, but we've rambled a bit on that particular topic. So official stance here on the on the Kimbrel, uh, Kimbrel take. Absolutely not. I think I think we're both in that boat. Do not fork out twenty million dollars for Craig Kimbrel. We are yes. just fine internally. Yes, unless of course you're getting him specifically to trade him for the next Nick Pavetta. In which case, why the hell not? Um, sarcasm. I hope is understood via the mic. Um, but our, uh, our final take for, for today that there's no specific take here. This has just been, or no specific tweet or anything like that. Um, but in light of Brett Brown, uh, the, the 76ers organization has already come out and stated he will be back for next year, which I am super grateful for him. I'm a, everyone who listens to any of our shows. If you listen to TJ's one of us, if you listen to crossing borders here, if you listen to some of our other segments, I work them into that as well. Um, I'm very much a pro Brett Brown guy, and I'm glad that this was something that they got out ahead of almost immediately after the season had ended. And they said he is back. He's deserved that. Philadelphia sports Twitter is completely polarized on this. This is one of those ones where I do feel as though if seven days a week I put out a poll that said, are you happy with Brett Brown being here for for next season? 50% are going to say yes. 50% are going to say no. Seven days a week, twice on Sunday. Excuse the corniness on that particular thing. But that's how polarizing him and his position as the head coach of the Philadelphia 76ers is. You and I have been been very different. I think I've been very different than almost everyone here in studio on this take. Uh, You've always been a little bit you know, leery as to whether or not you're, you're on board for Brett Brown or not. I'm curious, did his adjustment level in the playoffs and the way that he managed three or four different rosters in one single season this year kind of change your mind? And has my tone in, in this particular pitch to you right now made you change your mind and say that Brett Brown, damn it, give him another year? It definitely has nothing to do with your tone of voice. Um, Shit. I, I, I've been I trying. Did give- I do give him the benefit of the doubt, and you're right, I have been quite leery with him because if we had been, let's say, eliminated by Brooklyn, I would have been calling for his head and calling for his job because that's the Brooklyn Nets here against. Come on. But we got eliminated by a Raptors team who's been together all year, who properly managed their superstar so that he could then go out there and hit the most infamous shot in the NBA for the next 50 years, as well as put up about 40 points a night on us. Um, but no, I think the, I think the big thing, like I, I listened to a lot of satellite radio. I listened to Adam shine and I've listened to him literally rip apart the Sixers for keeping Brett Brown. And you know what? He also ripped apart Almost every coach hiring, except for the Cavaliers who got uh, Beeline, the one from Michigan. Mich- yeah. Yeah, he, he praised that, but he literally ripped apart every coach hiring because he, he believe, it's as if he believes there's no better coach out there. My take on this situation was a coach is only as good as the pieces he's given to succeed. And I believe that the best option to replace Brett Brown was already off the market in assistant coach Monty Williams. If there was going to be a replacement for Brett Brown, I, I really like Monty Williams. I, I, it's, it's, it breaks my heart to see him go, and I think the Suns are getting an incredible coach. But I don't think you could go out on the open market and find a better coach. Brett Brown literally played with a bunch of different lineups. He His main core starting group, played 10 games together, heading into the playoffs. Uh, Like I said, if it was the first round and we got eliminated, I'd probably call for his job. But he made some good adjustments to save the Brooklyn series. He made some awesome adjustments to 
make the Raptors ser- series salvageable as well. We should have been going to overtime. It still breaks my heart. We should have been going to overtime. That shot is just unreal. Every time I see it, that I think they find ways to slow it down even more. And just watching it bounce, I'm like, oh, man. It that should be sense. us playing the Bucks. Yeah, look, even watching that game last night, you know, uh, it's it's weird for for no reason whatsoever. Uh, you know, just watching a Bucks Raptors game, you know, and three minutes in and eight minutes in and whatever the hell it may be, nothing happens. They may even be in a timeout, and I get irrationally filled with rage because we're better than both of those teams, and I wholeheartedly believe that that if healthy. We are better than both of those teams. We played you know Milwaukee. You know what fills me with rage is the fact that he went, Leonard went and put up 30 points through three quarters and then put up three in the fourth. Like, why couldn't you do that in game seven against us, Kawhi? Why? <laughs> no, you know what? If that had happened, that three points would have been the three-pointer to end the game and probably. end our series, probably. Probably that is the way that, that things work here in Philadelphia sports. And and again, we will eventually, I think, have uh, we've talked about it in the past, having a heartbreak episode uh, where we go ahead and we, we kind of relive all of the worst moments throughout our lifetime uh, in, in Philly sports. Some of the worst defeats that we've had, um, you know, we, we thought it would be not necessarily fun, but therapeutic to just go about them once la- one last time and then to actively choose to never relive them again. It'll let uh, be one slow-ass week in sports to depress us like that. But Tell me about it. Um, which, again, may be the reason why we have yet to do something like that. Um, you know, but uh, for, for me, the, the Brett Brown thing comes down to, um, you know, just like what you said, who, who are you replacing this man with? You know, who on the market right now? Who, and Jay Wright, get the hell out of here. He's not leaving Villanova with that cozy-ass job over there, and I'm not convinced Jay Wright is an NBA coach. Somebody you know, somebody suggested Ty Lu to me, and I was like, we get don't have James. What do you yeah. – we, we don't, well, according we don't to have Twitter, we're trading straight to control up. him. Yeah, well, Ty Lu is, is just – well, whatever. Uh, <laughs> he's not a real coach. He's just a parent that's just standing on the sidelines saying, what do you want to do, LeBron? Yeah. Um, but uh, my, my only gripe for this entire season with Brett Brown, and, and it is truly only uh, maybe two. I have two um, because they go hand in hand. You knew going into this season that you needed to continue to manage Joel Embiid. He is a guy who is going to battle injuries his entire career. It's just the reality of it. It's it's what his body and frame is. He's going to, to, and the way that he plays, he ends up on the floor more than on anyone in goddamn basketball. And he's seven foot two, and, and however the hell much he weighs. Man, his first half, Joel Embiid played more minutes than any big man in the NBA. That's inexcusable to me. That 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 is the only fireable offense that that Brett Brown had. The mm-hmm. second part of this is the fact that at no point this season. Did he make anyone behind Joel Embiid a playable five so that you could give him a spell in the playoffs or the second half of the season where, again, out of necessity, Joel Embiid had to play 40, 40 plus minutes a night in the most meaningful basketball games of the season and in the playoffs. That's not good for him. That is not good for the Sixers because you put in Greg Monroe for 97 seconds and he was a minus freaking 12. In an elimination game. And you couldn't like, let Bobin touch a court because every time he touched he's the not court, athletic enough. it was turnovers. Yep. And that's that's the biggest thing. And so the, whether it's Jonah Bolden, whether it would have been uh, Patton, who, again, Patton was coming off a broken foot and spent most of, the, most of the year in the G League before his cup of coffee up here, and then he was dismissed. But I, I wish that throughout this regular season, knowing how good your team was, knowing that when you acquired Jimmy Butler, you, you were going to be a legitimate playoff contender regardless, then knowing when you got Tobias Harris, you are a, a championship-level contender at this point with that starting five. The fact that you didn't dictate and, and dedicate all of the time in the world to some of your reserve centers, to getting them truly meaningful minutes and really coach them up to make them playable. That to me was frustrating, you know, that because that, again, that does a disservice to your superstar and, and, uh, and Joel Embiid because he needs to stay on the court almost the entire freaking game. And it's just not, it's not conducive for, for long-term success in a series, let alone a career for someone like Joel Embiid. 
you know, but, but outside of that, Brett Brown coached four different teams this year. You know, he, he, his starting, his starting lineup in an opening night featured Markel freaking faults. 10 games after that, he, he went away from that and, be, and went back to JJ. And then after that, he acquired Jimmy Butler. And then after that, he acquired Tobias Harris. You know, not to mention what, what little bench he had continued to diminish with each one of those trades as well. What this guy was able to do this year and not having your superstar and the the, the centerpiece of, of the success of your team and Joel Embiid available to you through like 80% of the second half of the season because he ran him into the ground and he had a knee injury and then he had to sit out all those games and he played a few, then he had to sit out a bunch, then he had to play one, then sit out a few. Going in, you didn't have that time to, to gel. You didn't have that time to, 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 to really stir that drink together and says, damn, this is good. He robbed them of that. That's the only gripe I have of him, you know, throughout this entire year. But when you take a look at it and coaching four different teams the way that he did and then coaching a team that, that a starting five, the team is the starting five. There's no goddamn bench. You had James Ennis and you had Mike Scott and, and then you had freaking nothing after that. Seven guys is all he had to beat the best in the world. And he took it to a game seven to me. I can't I, I can't say enough good things about him. The, my only gripe is his use of Joel Embiid. Absolutely. He's got to use Embiid way more intelligently next year. And I think he's learned that the hard way. And Elton Brand has to really kill it this offseason. He has to get Jimmy Butler back. He's got to – I'm not as high on Tobias Harris as most. Get Jimmy Butler back for sure and get some depth behind – those those key players like Joel Embiid you don't want to have to you you don't want like I think there was one point in the series where Monroe went out they gave up a basket and Embiid came right back out like you can't have that you gotta be able to trust some a backup in the playoffs for the three or four minutes that your man wants to breathe and and stretch out so I think it's in order to see Brett Brown truly succeed we really need to see an amazing offseason from Elton Brand and the scouts and everyone at the head office level. I could not agree more. This is we're, we're actively approaching the most critical offseason in 76ers recent history. Um, you I know, think I, we have, what, four people under contract? So you're basically staying with a brand new team. So get yeah. it right. And again, I, I think on, on next week's episode of uh, TJ's One of Us is, is our armchair GM episode where we sit here and we break down the offseason. And uh, and if we were to configure the, the roster and offseason for the 76ers, what we would do, including the draft process uh, and who would be made available to us at, what are we, 16? I think we're yep. 16th. Uh, um, yeah. Sounds right. Actually, no, no I think we're no, later we're than that. 24, 24, 24. 24, 33, and 34. Yeah, it's so, you know, I mean, what you're going to get there is, you know, hopeful of another Landry Shamit type of, of bench player that can kind of jump in there and not the Furkan Korkmaz uh, experience. Um, but, you know, so again, we'll, we'll touch more into to the offseason of things like that. But uh, I am very much on, on the same page as you. I, I'm get Jimmy Butler at all costs. Um, I have gone both ways on, on the Tobias Harris thing. You know, I, I've. You know, upon the trade, I said, sign him, you know, get it done immediately. Um, you know, and then the way seeing how dysfunctional he seemed to be here uh, on the court and he just didn't necessarily fit in. I, I felt like mm, we could probably do without. And then I saw Brett Brown make an adjustment, you know, somewhere in that Brooklyn series where suddenly he realized the, the way to maximize the usage of of a player like Tobias Harris because he is not J.J. Redick. He's very different. He's a different kind of shooter. Uh, and he allowed some more freedom and on-the-ball movement uh, with him, and I, I thought that was a great adjustment in a way but to maximize. But then he returned to being garbage in Toronto. I think if you look at the plus-minuses of all the starters, he was one of the worst. Well, he was. He had a hell of a time defensively in that series. He just did not look good, um, you know. And that led more to to some of that because there were a handful of games and there were Tobias. You know, he shot the basketball fairly efficiently. I, I think at least two of those games, the other five games, he. He really he struggled behind the arc. He struggled to find that shot. Um, you know, but I do credit uh, I do credit Brett Brown for 
finding the the ways to use him to make him comfortable enough to even shoot the basketball. Um, because if, if we're not crying about him missing shots, we'd be crying about him not taking them, just like we are with Ben Simmons. Not me in particular. I love Ben Simmons. Uh, but Philadelphia Sports Twitter and, and just fans in, in general, um, you know, they're always going to find something to gripe about. Um, but we are, we are quickly uh, approaching the end of, of this segment here. I didn't realize we've gone as long as we have. Um, so... I feel like we'll have slightly different takes here uh, on this one. But, uh, you know, if, if you had a sales pitch to, to Twitter right now about your confidence level on oh. Brett Brown going into next season, where is it at? My sales pitch is Elton Brand has got to go sit down with Howie Roseman. And <laughs> a lesson – in what to do with all this cap space and what to do with all these open roster spots and get it done for Brett Brown. I think we, we've discussed Brett Brown, and I think it, that this offseason has everything to do with whether or not Brett Brown is a coach in years after next year. It's all about Elton Brand. So my sales pitch is, is that we should really just – Forget about Brett Brown and harass the hell out of Elton Brand to get the job done and get it done right. I actually love that. And it, it comes full circle for me for, for your very first statement uh, on this partic- particular topic where you said a head coach is, is essentially only as good as the pieces he is given to succeed with. Um, you know, and you stayed true to that throughout that whole take. And I appreciate that because um, I am a guy who places more stress on the success of Elton Brand in this offseason as well. Um, you know, for for me, I would say do the hard thing. Challenge yourselves as fans to do the hard thing and look beyond for just be a, a critical thinker. Look beyond the thoughts of Twitter. Look beyond the thoughts of blue checkmark individuals and sports radio call-ins and you know, your ESPN shows and your Comcast Sportsnet crap. Just sit there and critically think and form your own opinion. Take a look at all the things that personally bother you about Brett Brown. Take a look at, at his numbers in those areas over the last three seasons. Take a look at what you would expect them to be if he had a full season of Jimmy, Tobias, Ben, Joe, and J.J., I guarantee you those numbers will have improved each of the last three seasons and your excitement as a result, getting 82 games out of that instead of 27 games with at least three of them on the court and only 10 to 12 during the regular season with all four of them on the court or five of them on the court. If you include JJ, you should be ecstatic to have this man back. He continues to improve in all the things that we, that we, suffered through throughout his early tenure and most of those things are not as at a uh, are at fault of him you know it goes back to kind of what you said connor you know he was think about you know what he inherited from hinky you know and that was all part of the plan and part of the process and that is what it is you know and then you had the colangelo era who completely neglected the bench forever okay why did we lose the toronto series we had no goddamn bench we didn't have anything left to to attack the bench needs with after Elton went out and got two superstars and said, you know what, we're just going to bet that our starting five beats your starting five and hope to God it works through a seven-game series. And we were one shot short. That is not a reflection of Brett Brown. Brett Brown did everything he could, as you, as you mentioned and, and perfectly said, to make that a salvageable series effort. To me, you have got to challenge yourself to critically think and form your own opinion and not something that I'm telling you to think, something that Connor's telling you to think, something that ESPN, Comcast Sports, WIP, anything is telling you to think. Formulate your own thought because Brett Brown, you will find, has improved in every single area that you criticize. It's not going to be perfect, but he's going to improve. So big off season for Elton Brand to give our head coach in Brett Brown, a team that he can form an identity that is going to be an identity for longer than 20 games. He has never played with a a roster that is 20 games straight the same. Let's give this guy the pieces. Let's echo what Connors has has asked for. Let's give him the pieces that says, I'm going to make you a successful head coach because I'm going to give you the tools to do it. Um, Do you have any final thoughts on the 76ers one here? I think we covered it off. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, 
we're going to figure this out on air real quick um, you know, because I'm going to forget to the second we hang up here. Um, we were thinking about doing a second uh, Crossing Borders this week, and we were going to do specifically the, the tweet that you had sent me uh, detailing the most overrated, underrated, best player, newest addition, good surprise, takes a leap, improve it year for each of the four teams. Did we still have interest in doing that this week? Absolutely. That's All one right. of the things that uh, give a quick preview of the Kelly Green Hour. That's one of the segments parts that we're doing is one just eagles me versus l i i hope this is probably one of the first times we're actually going to disagree on things so i'm looking forward to the listen um and i've always said it i do believe that both of you guys when you do differ in your opinions you guys will formulate very very good debates um so hopefully we echo those things and here on crossing borders where we can sit here and put together something uh, for, for each of the teams. So, so we will have a second crossing borders as we did miss last week. Um, and it will be specifically dedicated to the to the points that we just echoed there. Um, so good. Um, uh, we will also work on adding some inner segment bits here as well. Um, so if you listen to crossing borders, if you listen to this segment regularly, or if you listen to any of our others, uh, and you have a, a specific segment, inner segment idea that you would like us to use in these segments, feel free, reach out to us uh, through the AMY podcast account. It's at AMY podcast. You can also reach out to Connor on Twitter at Connor 10. That's Connor T-E-N, not the number 10. You can also reach out to me, Shane underscore Mead. Uh, and then you can always use the hashtag crossing borders AMYP. Uh, but that is going to be it. That's going to wrap up crossing borders for number one for this week we will be back with that second episode at some point later in the weekend um but for now connor as always a pleasure sir let's let the jackdaws carry us out a fighting man i used to be revered and feared through killarney now i'm back to hitching me with the wind but if mickey flynn should ever fight me i'll throw me caution all behind me and square off on that son of a bitch again he cracked a bit of This has been a production of the Always Next Year Podcast Network. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, Spreaker, and SoundCloud. Please also remember to rate and review this podcast to validate our members' life choices. We appreciate it. This is AMYP, signing off.